God is not a man. How many are thankful that that is the case? You're glad that God's not a man. God is not a man. So he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? You need to understand something. As you're reading that, there, the, the person who's writing that is Moses. And he's writing it as God told him, I want you to go and bring the people out of Israel, out of bond, out of slavery. And God did that. God, God promised, I'm going to bring you into this land. I'm going, to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bless you. And he brought them through the Red Sea. And, and all this, he, he conquered his enemies, the, their enemies. And he brought the plagues upon the Egyptians. God declared each and every time that his promises were true. God declared, God promised that every day they wake up, there will be food for them. He promised that they would have water. I mean, think about this. In the desert place, we went over this before. Remember talking about the mind-blowing God? And I was talking about what God did in the wilderness, what it would have taken for, 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 for all these people, these like two and a half million Israelites, to live basically in the desert. And God supplied that need each and every day for how long? Y'all remember for how long did he do that? For 40 years. So this is the guy writing this here, the guy who experienced this. And he says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? So understand when we're talking about God's promises as we go through this series, that you can grab a hold of this and understand that the promises God made, they are for you. They're, they're for, again, especially being a child of God. There's some promises that are for everybody, but the, but the majority of the promises are in the Word of God are for children of God, those who are believers in Jesus Christ. So as a follower of Jesus here this morning, understand this message is for you. It is here to encourage you. God wants you to know He can be counted on. He can be counted on. Amen? So today, this is the promises I want to look at. I want to look at God's promises of victory over sin. I told you earlier what some of the promises and comps, and we're going to hit several of these things today. Because in the message today, we're going to talk about the defeat of our enemy, salvation, victory over sin, and eternal life. It's going to be all accomplished that. I'm going to try to do it rather quickly, okay? Because, it, again, it, it, we, we don't, it doesn't take a long time to do this, so I'm going to try not to commentate too, too much. But that may be hard. You know me sometimes, okay? But the promise of victory started in the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the, New, in the New International Version, this is what we're reading. He says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike, some versions say, crush your head, but you will strike his heel. All this was pointing to the fact that Jesus was going to come to defeat the enemy. God, God here in Genesis, after the fall, when all this takes place, God is promising that, that he's sending a Savior to defeat the enemy. But so God here, He declares that the offspring of woman, in other words, talking about the coming Messiah, was going to be victorious. He was going to defeat the serpent. But is this where, is this where the thought of victory, is this the where the thought of defeating the enemy began? Is this where this, when, when He begins to talk to Eve, is this where God's mind is now working how to figure out the plan of salvation? Is this the beginning that I was referring to when I said in, in, that this was. Victory over the enemy over sin was declared in the beginning. Is this the time period I'm talking about? Is this the actual occasion that I'm saying this is where this came to pass? No, it's not. Because I want you to read, I want you to hear and listen to what Peter says. And then I'm going to jump into the book of Revelation and, and read what it says. Because this is not when God spoke to Eve in the garden. And he spoke to Adam in the garden. That is not where the plan of salvation began. That is not where victory over sin began. God, that's the first recorded place where we see him speak of it. Where it's going to happen. But that is not where the plan began. And here's, here, here's what I want you to understand. I get this this morning. So, again, how many times do you ever say, nothing ever takes God by surprise? Okay? Nothing ever takes him by surprise. And I want to show it to you here. In these two portions of scripture, okay? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, listen to what Peter says. He says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. Let me just stop there a second. What did we receive from Adam and Eve? An empty life. An empty something that's empty usually means it's worthless. 
We received an empty life from your ancestors. You inherited that. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which loses its value. Who here, um, if, if you have any type of 401k, if you have any type of pension plan, what is it usually, where is it right now? Where, where, I mean, you may have it with the government, but where does the government usually have those pension plans? They're usually what, in like in mutual funds, they're in the stock market, because why? They're trying to build your plan. And we know the stock market does what? It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. The price of silver and gold goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. And Peter, and Peter here says, it was not paid with mere gold or silver which loses their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Now listen to what it says in the next verse. And you understand what I'm talking about. God chose him as your ransom long before the world, what? Long before the world, what? Began. And now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Revelation 13, 8 says, And all the people who belong to this world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered, what? Before the world was made. So you understand what I'm trying to tell you? The plan of salvation. The plan of eternal life. The plan of victory over sin. The plan of the enemy being defeated. In each and every single one of these portions of Scripture, it says here, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, and he's the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. So before God even made this world, before he ever made Adam and Eve, Jesus Christ is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. God already had the plan of salvation in effect. The plan of the plan of salvation, victory over sin, was in the mind of God before the world was even formed. It was the plan from the beginning of time. Like I said, Adam and Eve sinned and did not catch him off guard. It did not catch him off guard. And I sort of got ahead of myself here when I made a statement there. But I had this question here. I said, who is the Lamb of God, the Christ? And I just I sort of most of you know the answer anyway, but I sort of got ahead of myself when I, when I said something there just a little while ago. But here's what John the Baptist says in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. It says, The next day John saw Jesus walking towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. So who is the Lamb of God? Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God. But I want you to notice, did you notice what John the Baptist also said about Jesus? What was I just telling you just a, a, a minute or so ago? Is that he was what? The plan of salvation was a design when? Before the world began. What did you declare about Jesus? Long before me. He existed long before me. Again, talking about that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So who is the lamb of God? The Christ It is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Because of Jesus, the lamb of God, God promises us victory over sin. I'm right now, I'm going I'm I'm to slam you with some verses here. Okay? But I want you to understand something. I believe in God's unconditional grace, period. But understand this. And no matter, no matter what we do, you know, I know God's grace is sufficient. I know no matter how many times we mess up, we can go for the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, but He's willing to forgive. But the problem is that there, 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 there is a heresy that's being preached in churches today. And it's this. That you have to sin a little bit every day. Or, or, or it's this. Everyone sins a little bit every day. I don't believe that. 
Because it speaks against what God declares in His Word. I'm getting ready to show it to you here. There's some scripture here. What it is, you have, you have a church who's grabbing a hold of this being declared, and what it is, they're saying, well, since I sin a little bit every day and His grace is sufficient, let me just go ahead and do what I want to do. And what I'll do, I'll just ask for forgiveness. And I'm saying that's a dangerous, dangerous road to be walking down. Extremely dangerous. Because there is a place where you get where your conscience becomes seared with a hot iron. And all of a sudden, stuff that, that is wrong, you begin to justify say, well, since it doesn't bother me anymore, I must be okay. And there, there is a danger that this is a, this is a, that this is a damnable heresy that's going through the church. But understand this: the same grace that saved you, the same amazing grace that saved you, is the same amazing grace that can keep you to have that can continue to give you victory over sin. And it's more, and that victory over sin is more than just saying, "Lord, forgive me," but it gives you the power. To no longer yield to sin. And I'm going to prove it to you here in the verses we're going to be reading. But again, the problem is, you have too many churches, all they, all they do, they preach a hyper grace. It's all, again, don't, I understand you. I believe in grace. But the same grace that saved you is the same grace that will sustain you and allow you to live a life of holiness before the Lord. And when I mean holiness, I'm not talking about how you look on the outside. I'm not talking about you, you say the right words. I'm talking about when you're truly, because of what Jesus Christ has done in you, you have separated yourself from the world. That's what holiness means. It means set apart. I'm going to read to you what God's Word declares about God's promises over vic of victory over sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil. What's the modern philosophy going around the church? Everybody sins a little bit every day? What's John saying here? So, 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 so because you're now under grace, when you sin, it's no longer truly considered sin? But yet, how many people believe that stuff and live that stuff? But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. What does it say next, though? But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. When you destroy something, what does that mean? You get rid of it. You annihilate it. He came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 through 57 says, For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power, but thank God he gives us victory over sin. What does he do? He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So here's the thing. Either that's true or it's not. We receive victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 22 through 23 says this. But now you are free from the power of sin. Let me stop there a second. What's Romans declaring? We're free from the power of sin. In other words, temptation may come. Things may come and say, hey, Bless remember you. this? It doesn't disappear. Doesn't this look good? Does... But what Paul declares here is that the power of sin is gone. Sin only, once you come to Jesus Christ, sin only has the power over you that you get. I don't know where these people get these philosophies. And yet people... People swallow the whole elephant. I wanted to make it big. Well, I could say a blue whale. Let's make it even bigger. But now, you are free from the power of sin. And have, listen, and have become slaves of God. See, that's where we fell a lot of times. We don't truly yield ourselves to God the way we should. We really don't submit to His authority. And that's why we're constantly yielding to sin. He's given us the power. He's freed us. 
But you are now free from the power of sin. So let, let, let that settle in. You know, uh, what do I have up there? What's on, that, what's on that banner there? Jesus himself said, the Son sets you free. You are truly free. And here Paul declares that you are now set free. You are now free from the power of sin and become slaves to God. He's done this. He's made it available for us. This is and now, now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin, see many times we just hear verse 23 because we want people to know this. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, we hear that verse, but we need to jump to that verse ahead of it, before it, and read what it says. That sin no longer has any power over us. Which means you have been given the freedom. You have been given the power through Jesus Christ to say no. When the enemy comes, you can say no. See, here's the mistake a lot of Christians make. They think just because they're tempted, they sin, so they might as well go ahead and continue. Temptation is not sin. Yielding to temptation becomes sin. You know how I know that? You all remember Jesus was baptized. When he came out, God declared what he declared. This is what the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, drove him into the wilderness to be what? To be tempted. So temptation to sin, did Jesus sin? And we know Jesus is a spotless lamb. He did not sin whatsoever. So temptation is not a sin. It's yielding to temptation that leads to sin or is sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And verse 14 of Romans 6 declares this. Sin is no longer your master. See, this should be getting you excited. Because all this, if you, you can sit and God, see, these are promises of God. These are declarations of the Lord, of the word of the Lord. And we can grab a hold of these things and understand that sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. See again, I said grace, grace is vital. But just because His grace is abundant, His grace is always sufficient, that doesn't mean we just keep on sinning. Because Paul deals with that in this book of Romans. Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid! But again, I want you to say, God has declared that Jesus has given us victory over sin. He's given us power over sin. He's made it powerless. We now have victory over sin because sin is no longer our master. Because in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, here's what we read. And I, this is God speaking through, through the prophet Ezekiel. And I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them, I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. Understand what God's declaring here. See, see, in the New Testament, Paul put it this way. I am a new creation in Christ. The old life is gone and a new one has begun. See, the difference that Jesus makes is that all of a sudden the ability comes in there where God is fulfilling this promise to where we're no longer trying to rely upon our own reason and understanding, but because of what Christ did and our belief in Him, something literally takes place like a creation type event takes place in our life that literally changes who we are. And you've heard me say this before. You don't worry about not lying anymore because God, through changing you, takes away the desire to lie. You don't worry about not stealing because God, through the creation process of salvation, has taken away the desire to steal. See, He's taken away the power of sin. But too many times, we listen to everything around us. We listen to the lies of the enemy. We listen to heresy that's out there. And we allow it to come in and we give sin back power that Jesus has already taken away.
You know, I know His grace is sufficient. But wouldn't you rather give all you can and live for Him to the fullest of your ability than constantly just falling down to the cross and saying, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Hey, I'm grateful for His forgiveness. But I'd rather live victoriously. You get my drift? Because you just got to go back to think about what 1 John 3 8 says. You don't have to go back there, Sammy. About when it says, when people keep on sinning, it shows they really belong to who? The devil. The devil. And again, this isn't Pastor Sammy. I'm just reading what the Word says. You can do with it what you want. I'm just praying to you the Word. In Ezekiel 36. Verse 26, it says, And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. See, again, he, he's reiterating that promise. And then, and then he says in, in Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, he says, But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instruction deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. He's promised what here? He's promising victory. He's promising, promising a change. He's promising salvation. You see how it's all, all, all tying in? I said we're going to hit all these things here really quickly together. In Hebrews 8, verse 10 it says, But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel all that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. See, I, I want you to understand that time and time again throughout Scripture, God is declaring that we have victory over sin. He's given us victory over sin. He's made sin powerless. Where Jesus, He came, Jesus came what, to destroy the works of the devil. Sin no longer has any power over us. But the thing is, we have to believe it. We have to live in it. All this stuff where people say, well, well Pastor, I just can't myself. Yes, you can You just need to keep your eyes upon the Lord. Keep on trusting in Him. Keep on depending. Believe in what His Word says. Because I'm going to tell you, until you do, you're going to struggle. And understand, when I talk about what a promise is, God promised this so we as believers in who He is and who the Son is, we can claim these promises. Yes. We can claim these declarations. Yes. And we can begin to live them because yes. they are the Word of God. They are the yes. promises of God. Do you understand? Praise God. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. God promises victory over sin through the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So in closing, now there, I'm, my closing will be a little bit lengthier today, okay? But this is the last thought I want to really deal with. Listen. How can you receive this victory and promise? Too many times we make things too complicated, too difficult. But I'm going to show you real, real quickly through the Word of God what God says about how you can receive this victory and this promise. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, this is another well-known verse, but, but it's essential to this. But if we confess our sins to Him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all wickedness. See, sometimes what we fail to understand about that verse, that we say to cleanse us from all wickedness, that doesn't mean He just forgives us of our sins. That means He comes in, if you allow Him to, He'll come in and, like I said earlier, we don't worry about not lying, because why? The desire to lie has been taken away. In other words, he's replaced it with the desire to be truthful. We don't worry about not stealing 
because the desire to steal has been taken away because he's replaced it with a desire to be honest. Understand? See, that's what Jesus does. He takes the bag, gets rid of it, and replaces it with something better. See, too many times we look at the don'ts, 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 and forget, and we, and we fail to understand what he, he replaces with something so much better you want. So much better. And that's why we don't have to yield to sin anymore. Because when he does that creative work, he gives us a desire, a desire to do something else. But the problem is, we allow false thoughts to get into our minds. We allow lies to get in, and we allow them to lead us astray. And we, 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 we allow them to, to, to literally give power to something that Jesus took power from. Well, what have we got to do? If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Understand this. You also got to understand this. You got to settle this in your heart and mind, too. When you ask Jesus to forgive you, it's settled. It's done. You don't have to worry about performing some big feat. You don't have to worry about performing some big bow or, 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 or promise you made. Well, Lord, if you do this, um, you, you know, like years ago, I forget um, what the name of the movie is now. Uh, a guy sent me the, the video link a while back ago. I'm going back years ago, but this is an old movie where Burt Reynolds in this movie decided he's going to kill himself. So somehow, somehow, he gets himself dropped off in the ocean somewhere. All of a sudden, he decided he wants to live. And he starts swimming towards shore. And he's making all these promises to God. You know? I mean, I mean, he, I mean you, you name the promise, he made it. And then as he gets close to the shore, he begins to renege on his promises. Yes. Until finally he steps on the shore, he says, ah, you know I was going to break him anyway, so just forget it. <laughs> See, we think we have to make some big deal with God. And we don't. We just have to simply believe in Jesus Christ. We just have to simply believe in Jesus Christ. Now that belief, remember I told you, when I talk, when I talk about belief, and when the Word talks about belief, it's always belief in action. It's not just here. It's here, here, and here. Romans 10, verses 9 through 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by opening, declaring your faith that you are Say So when it means openly declare, it means you let people know. You cannot be an undercover Christian. You've heard me say this before, and I'm going to say it again. You need to stick out like a sore thumb, but in a good way. There's a lot of bad ways people do that. That's why the church has a reputation that it has in America. We need to stick out for Him in a good way. In a good way. Let people truly see who Jesus is. Not the condemnation. Let the Holy Spirit take care of what the Holy Spirit takes care of. We just need to live Jesus before us. John 3, 16-18 declares this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. So again, if we believe in what? It's belief in action. We will have eternal life. Now listen to what it says in verse 17. Too many times, again, we, sometimes you need to put all these verses together yep. so, you, so you can see a fuller picture of things. Yep. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. Jesus, you've heard me say this many, many times. Jesus didn't come to tell you how bad you are. He came to offer you love and forgiveness. We already know how bad you are. He came to offer you love and forgiveness. That's what it says in verse 18. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. Again, it's belief in action. Who believes in Him. But anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. You've heard me say this time and time again. There's only one reason you go to heaven. 
and there's only one reason you go to hell. It's either your belief in Jesus Christ is why you go to heaven, or your lack of belief in Jesus Christ is why you go to hell. God doesn't send you there, you right. send yourself. Right. But that's the only reason you go to heaven or hell. And see, your lack of belief allows you to get back into sin and allow sin to come in and become more of a separation. So sin does have a part of it, but, 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 but sin's not what sends you to hell. It's your lack of belief in Jesus Christ. And you show your lack of belief in Jesus Christ by not living in the freedom that he's given you. Understand? Isn't that what it says there? There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. Acts 2, 38-39 says, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. But we must again, we must repent and turn away. As Jesus said to the woman called the act of, of adultery, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do what? Sin. Sin. No more. So this stuff that people say that sin, when, when Jesus sets you free, that sin has power over you? Isn't that just going contrary to what he just said to that woman? You, you, you understand what I'm saying? But, but too many times, we, we, we swallow this hook, line, and sinker. And Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So how can we receive this victory and promise? It's by truly believing in Jesus Christ and accepting who He is and letting Him come in and do the work in your heart and your life that you never can do. But I sort of like what Paul said in Romans. He says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have, in other words, the, a, a prerequisite is you must believe that he rose from the dead. You must believe that he was crucified. But again, there's, there's, there, 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 there's, there's theologies that out there that teach that it doesn't matter. Yes, it does, because without that, sin would not have been defeated. Receive it by believing in Him. See, you must believe and receive Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but understand this even more so importantly, and your sin also. See, sometimes I think we don't we don't have a problem comprehending and believing that Jesus died for the sins of the world, which we know He did. But understand this. He died for your sins too. He broke, he broke the power of sin over the world. But understand this. He broke the power of sin in your life also. And the great thing is this is a promise that God has made. And he has fulfilled. It's not a promise we're still waiting on. It's a promise that he has fulfilled. In the likeness and in, in, in the being of his son... Jesus Christ, when he came and he died on the cross and rose again, he fulfilled. He, he delivered us. That's what Paul, Paul is talking about that in Romans. If you've never read the book of Romans, you need to read it. You need to read it and you need to study it and see what it really declares about the freedom that we have because of Jesus Christ. And how, I mean, I don't get how these people can read this stuff and still say this stuff. God's promises over promises victory over sin it's already been accomplished so again as I started the message with this one phrase I'm going to end it with this phrase again in a world of broken promises God can be kind 
And what I want to let you know is, I didn't come to beat you up with you. I come to enlighten you, to let you know that when the enemy comes against you, just look at him and say, you know what, devil? You're like, speak to him. First of all, don't speak to him in your mind. Let me, let, me give, let, me give you, let me give you some let me give you some help here. Only God can read our thoughts. The devil cannot. So if you're sitting there and you're, you're thinking, devil, leave me alone, it's not doing you any good. Because he can't read your mind. When you, if you're ever going to talk to the devil, you need to vocalize it. You need to say, devil, leave me alone. You're a liar. Get behind me. Nowhere do you read a scripture that, that, that when Jesus rebuked the devil, that he did in his mind. Well, Jesus thought, devil, leave me alone. Jesus said, get thou behind me, Satan. Or thus, it, it is also written, he spoke to you, again, he can't read your mind, so you have to speak to him. And tell him exactly who he is. And the thing is, when he comes against you, first off, remind him that you're not that person anymore. Because here's the thing, if you listen to somebody long enough, they can change your mind. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to go back to a president, two presidents ago. Three presidents ago. Four presidents ago, sorry. I, I, was, not, I was not a Bill Clinton fan. Okay? I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I wasn't a Bill Clinton fan. I didn't like it. But my understanding was people, I, I remember hearing somebody um, high up in our denomination who was invited in with other ministers to sit and talk with him and, and have a conversation and just to give him some spiritual advice. And the person going in admitted and said, look, I'm telling you, I don't like that. I, you know, his views are not my views. I just don't care for him. He said, but by the time, by the time I was finished talking, he said, when I went in there, all of a sudden, now talking to him, he made it where I could relate to him. And by the time I left there, I thought he was my best friend. <laughs> Even though our views were completely separate, the way we viewed things were completely different. In other words, he almost began to influence this guy's mind. And, again, and don't, don't, I'm not saying Bill, Bill Clinton's a devil. Okay? So understand me, I'm not saying that, okay? <laughs> it's just what came just to mind as I, as I was thinking about it. But if we're not careful, we listen to, if we listen to someone enough, they can begin to influence who we are. So what I'm telling you is, especially when it comes to you start listening to him enough, he'll get you to believe, believe his stuff. And that's why when you, when you, you suspect he's beginning to talk, you say, shut up, I don't want to hear you, that's not who I am, get away from you, liar. You, you, you need to tell him to go. Don't even entertain him in your presence. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because we, we, can, we just need to keep our eyes upon I'm asking musicians to come. We just want to close out with, with this song here. But again, I, I want you to understand, God, th th this is an awesome, awesome promise of the Lord. That He's given us victory over sin. And with that victory over sin, we receive eternal life. We receive salvation. We receive the promise of His return. All of this stuff. It all, it all comes. We, we, we receive the defeat of the enemy. God makes a lot of this. I mean, a lot of his promises are fulfilled in this one promise of God's promises of victory over sin. And I, and I hope and I hope that, that, that this ministers to you this morning and encourage you to help you say, you know what? I don't have to yield to that thing anymore. I don't have to give in anymore. Because I do believe in Jesus Christ. And if this word says, sin no more has any power over me, I'm going to stand upon that. I'm going to claim it. Because it's a promise God made. And one thing you know is, God can be counted on. In a world of broken promises, God can be counted on. So I pray that this song here will be your heart's cry today. We're going to end with This Is My Desire. And as we sing this song, if you're here this morning, say, Lord, I needed to hear that. Whether you need to be reminded of it, maybe you never knew it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you were wondering why you were struggling so much sometimes with sin. You never truly realized, you never realized that truly you have the power to say no. I mean, let's be honest. 
sometimes we just don't know. That's why it's so important to get rooted and grounded in the Word of God. To, to, to grab a hold of that. When we have these Bible studies, come out because it's a different time for us to sit down and talk and discuss. Make sure you're taking the Word of God, that, that, that you're grabbing hold of His promises. Like, like I shared with you last week, when you see a promise in the Word of God as you read, highlight it, underline it, and understand you can claim that promise as a believer in Jesus Christ. But as we were talking about today, have you victory over sin? I said this a little bit, I'll say it now. But tomorrow is Memorial Day. And we will, we will remember and honor those who gave their lives for the freedom we have in this country. And I thank so, I thank God for them so much for the price they're willing to pay. But the most homage we're going to pay to them, we need to understand that over 2,000 years ago, there was one who gave his life give us more than just living freedom as far as the secular world, but true freedom, spiritually and physically. And every, and, 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 and every sense of the word of freedom, he's made it available to us. But he gave us victory over sin, gave us eternal life, gave us salvation. So as we end today, we think about this victory over sin, contemplate it. As we sing this song, I said, maybe you didn't know, maybe, maybe you said, Lord, once again, again, not that you're repenting, you're, you're not asking for salvation again, but as you say, Lord, I want to recommit. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take you at your word. I'm, I'll make the declaration of the words. I'm going to draw a line in the sand the devil and say, devil, you know what? I'm crossing over no more. Because Jesus gave me freedom. And I don't have to yield. I don't have to give in. Because he broke the power of sin in my life. I believe in him. And now I'm going to stand in that promise. And I declare I'm going to live for him. I'm fresh in him. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to let his power bump up within me. So we're going to get in this service. See, this is my desire for you. The way you do that, the way you can truly yield to Him is as, as of course the song says, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. And every breath I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. This can be your prayer.